Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, probably, everybody, wherever you are. Servus Christo. Servus. Yeah. It's a very big pleasure to see you, and thank you very much for your um, accepting this invitation to participate our webinar. This is one of the series webinar just organized and hosted by the Russian Arbitration Association uh, using this pandemic time uh, and we'd like to be just effective, productive, motivated and this is probably a kind of event that helps us to be so. So, um, first of all, I would like to ask you what we are going to cook today. Yes, indeed. Well, uh, the topic is Wiener Schnitzel. Now, that's a pretty straightforward dish. It is a simple dish, but there's many simple things in life. It's easy to ruin it. So uh, I'll show you the few tricks you have to take into account, but no real Wiener Schnitzel without a potato salad. No proper potato salad without hot beef broth. So uh, I will show you not just the Wiener Schnitzel, you have to show you the potato salad. To do the potato salad, I have to show you how to do a proper good beef broth, which you may use for other occasions. And sort of along the way as a side product, you even get some nicely cooked beef, which will, can be used as a tafel spitz or for other things. And to round it up, I will show you how to make a type of biscuit uh, to can, you can put in the broth. We'll see if I manage. <laughs> okay, uh, so those are my two, two, two technical questions. Uh, I do not wonder why you just made this choice for the Wiener Schnitzel, because this is tradition uh, in Austrian cuisine. But my question is, first of all, this uh, ham and cheese biscuit, is it also a traditional side Very dish? Pretty. Yeah, the so-called Schöber biscuit. I mean, there are three, but well, there are a number of, of traditional sort of um, um, things, I don't know what the proper English word is, to put into a beef broth in Austria. The, the so-called Schöber biscuit is one type, and you can do it with, with ham and cheese, with herbs, just with cheese. You can put with peas, you can put anything in the dough you like. Uh, the others would be the semolina dumplings or the liver dumplings and the pancakes that's, and, and noodles. So. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> so both side dishes are traditional and are backtracking to Vienna schnitzel, right? Yeah, I mean the potato salad is really a must for, for a proper Wiener schnitzel and as I said the beef broth sort of is a necessity and I, I took the opportunity to show you also the basics of doing a good beef broth, which is easy if you know how to do it. Okay, and as far as I understood, you have already cooked, you have already prepared the beef broth. Well, obviously, I will show you steps because a good beef broth takes between two and three hours. So okay. I will show you the beginning of a beef broth and the end of it. Perfect, it's fantastic. Can we do it? Yeah, let's start. Yes. So, Just skipping two hours in between. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll do some magic tricks and we'll get there. <laughs> okay, fantastic. And so one more question. Uh, is it also doable to, to cook all three dishes? The main dish, uh, which is a schnitzel, and uh, two side dishes just within an hour? No, because you have to do the broth, but you could do the broth the day before, or if, if you keep it in the fridge three days before, because, you know, it's a nice soup, uh, you have the nice uh, beef, which you can use in different ways. Uh, you can even fill uh, the Russian, uh, the Siberian ravioli pelmini with it, although this is today not very frequent, but it's an old recipe. And you can use not only raw, but you can use the cooked to fill it, or you can cut it like a carpaccio with some oil and onions and beans. So there are many, or you can eat it as a tafel spitz. Yep. Okay, so could you just give us some uh, uh, guidance? What will be the first, uh, second, third step and what kind of ingredients do we have for each dish? Yes, I suggest that I, I start and I explain at the same time. So the first thing I have here, is onions, they are not peeled, yeah? So, I mean, of course, if there is dirt on the skin, I take it away. They are not peeled, they're just cut in half. I open my pot, which you cannot see behind me, and put them down with the cut face on the bottom. Aha, uh -huh, I see. 
you want to avoid having a major wax rub in your pot, you could put some aluminum foil in and then the onions. I don't do this because I don't mind scrubbing the pots and they give even an additional flavor. And you, so put, you, until, you put this aluminum, okay, so you put this aluminum into the pot, yeah? Into the pot and you put the onions on top of the aluminum foil, yeah? Okay. Okay. That is sort of easier, and then you let them you let them really uh, in there. I, I okay. have an example already to show you, and then we will we'll turn to something else because this is the first stage. And let me see whether I can grab one of the buggers. Okay. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you maybe, it, this is black. Okay. This is how it should be. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's really black because this is part of the intensive flavor okay. of, the, of the beef broth and the, the brown skin you keep on for the color. Mm -hmm. For it to, to have a nice uh, dark color, okay? And so how long uh, do you cook this onion in such a way? Um, well, probably it depends. I mean, I feed it the pot before, so I guess now it will take me about 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. until I can do the rest, which is relatively quick, and then it would simmer for two hours. Basically, it would simmer until the beef, which is in there, is tender. So you just take a fork, put it in the beef, and it goes in softly. The beef is done. I will show you afterwards what is then the finalizing step. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. If you do not mind, I, show, I share my screen and show very briefly the ingredients for the beef broth. Sure. Yeah, okay, I try to do it, okay. So, um, this is the list of ingredients for beef broth, uh, which should be cooked or prepared uh, like uh, as a homework. So, uh, we do have here onions, two pieces that should be cut into two parts each. We do have uh, some water, parsley, bay leaves, uh, black peppercorns, um, leek, uh, and of course, uh, a beef. Absolutely. Now, while you were explaining this, I've started uh, my first step for the potato salad. I've cooked potatoes in the skin. Of course, I don't do a four portion thing because it will, I just show you samples, obviously. So I just cooked three potatoes. I peel them. Uh, are they already cooked? Yeah, they I, are already I, cooked. Yeah, they are I, already I, cooked. Okay. Minutes, yeah. 20 minutes for them to cook. I mean, they should not be too soft, yeah? Uh, uh -huh. So it's good if they still have a bit of texture, yeah? Uh -huh. if, I if I understood you correctly, you even use uh, any special kind or type of potato. Well, idea, I mean, you should use waxy potatoes, yeah? Not the mushy ones for puree. Okay. A, 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 a variety which even in Austria is hard to get, and I don't think anybody outside will get it, which is called Kipfler. Yeah? Kipfler mm -hmm. is the croissant. It's the, they have a bit the shape of, of little croissants, and they are the perfect potato for the salad. But as I said, even in Austria, we don't get them all the time. So, I mean, if you use waxy potatoes, tasty ones preferably, yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, it's a good choice. Yeah, they will do the job. Okay, perfect. So I now have, you are preparing potato. You are just. I have, uh, I have now peeled the potatoes. I will burn my fingers a bit and I cut the potatoes in relatively thin slices, like this. Yeah? Very thin, yeah? Thin. It's very thin. So I relatively quickly cut them because they're still very hot. <laughs> and so where are you putting this? Just into the plate? Yeah, or? Sorry, you can't see that. I, I don't throw them on the floor. Okay. Um, <laughs> You, I just oh, put them in, ah, okay, in I see. because there will be some, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll add the first ingredients and then I let them sit for about 20 minutes, yeah? Uh -huh. And then I'll finish the potato salad, yeah? Okay. So I've done the cutting and all I do now is, I will show you, is to put some salt in. I mean, salt is always a matter of taste and... Uh, and sort of how the potatoes are, but I would not be sort of, uh, can add some salt. And now there is the, the third soup I had already prepared. Mm -hmm. uh, 
you would need the, the soup for the potatoes. I have some of the broth, which is ready, already made okay. uh, yesterday. And I pour it on the potatoes. Yeah. Okay. And I mix it thoroughly. Yeah, it, it's no harm if the potatoes sort of get a bit, uh, get a bit squashed. Yeah. Uh huh. So you really want uh, this to be a, a nice sort of uh, sauce already. Yeah. Okay. So, you so this is a sauce of potato. Well, in a way, I mean the, the broth. Yeah, the okay. broth uh, takes a bit of the starch out of the potatoes, and this gives you already sort of something nice and creamy. Yeah. Okay. So for these baggers, we will let uh, wait for about. Uh, we are 20 minutes and then we will finish that. Yeah. But it wouldn't be like a puree. No, no, it's not a puree. Now, okay. it, it is pieces of potatoes, but the sauce is, is, is relatively thick with it. It's not a thin okay. watery sauce. Yeah. Okay. I just need a, a, to cover them. Uh -huh. Because it's better you cover them because they should really sort of benefit from the heat that the soup was, was boiling hot, I put on. Yeah. Okay. okay, okay. Now we will look back at the broth. Yeah. Okay. All the onions now look more or less, yeah, as, I, as the ones I've shown to you. Yeah. Now. I, I suppose like a chocolate, it's very brown or not? <laughs> it, it is literally black. Ah, it's black. They are really, they are not brown, they are black. They are completely ah, okay. Black. But and only uh, oh, one side of, of onions, yes? This yes. the downside. Put them down with the face where they are cut. Okay. Yeah? Mm -hmm. so I take them out of the pot and keep them to the side. Yeah. Yes. It's a bit of time because I like to use lots of onions. Because they always give a nice background taste to things. So uh, are you using then the onions for something yes. else? Yeah, they will go back into the broth. Okay. Probably you could leave them in just the way it's done to take them out for a moment. And then you use fleshy bones. Okay. Bring them to a boil together with the onions. Yeah. Uh huh. But you want them to touch sort of the hot surface of the pot to seal. And if the uh -huh. onions are down there, they can't reach it. Yeah. Okay. So I've got the bones prepared here. You can't see it now, but quite a few things. So these are fleshy bones, right? Yes. I rinse them in warm water just shortly. No big exercise. You, you said warm water, yes? Yeah, I rinse them with some warm water. It's more a safety measure than anything else, yeah? Okay. okay. I put them in the pot. Yes, and you can use warm water because uh, water in Vienna, in Austria, is very clean, just we very can clean. use tap water, luckily, yes. Uh, it's, yeah. it's actually better than most mineral waters. Yeah. Yeah, we are very lucky we get not everything, but part of the water from the Styrian mountains directly from yeah. the heart. So that's, that's indeed a very lucky situation. Now, um, I will... I will, I will just check in. Um, so uh, we will put in the water and bring it to boil and also salt it. Water, yeah, I said two and a half liters. This is not scientific, yeah? If you put in three liters, there is no harm. It, uh, it evaporates anyway. I already have boiling water here. You don't have to do this, but it's quicker. Okay. So here, this blue pot is just boiling hot water. About two and a half liters, I pour it in. Yeah? Mm -hmm. I, so, uh, I'm, I'm understanding now that we are cooking today uh, not three but four dishes, yeah? <laughs> that's absolutely correct. <laughs> yeah. I challenge this. Absolutely. <laughs> it's like multi-contract or multi-party arbitration, something like that. <laughs> yes. Now, you, because the water was hot, I can immediately proceed to the next step, and then we will not look at this pot for today. It's my okay. soup. Uh -huh. I protect the black onions, right? Yeah. In the in the in the in the hot boiling water. 
I put in uh, the spices you mentioned, if I can find them somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Are you putting spicy into the broth, right? Out in the broth, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Then I put in a generous bunch of parsley. Oh. The whole thing. All I of mean, them? All of that. Okay. It's a very ancient dish. You boil beef with roots. They may have done that 5,000 or 10,000 years ago already. Okay, okay. Very basic old dish, yeah? Okay. Now, there is some, there are, is it, it the, the leek goes in yes. already? Because you don't eat the leek, right? You okay. For the taste. And the beef, this is a very nice Tafelspitz. It's very fine beef, yeah? Yeah. I put it in. I, yeah, it's boiling. I put it in when the water is boiling. The theory is, there are disputes, but the theory is it seals the meat and it keeps the meat uh, juicier. Okay. So it, I mean, there is enough taste in the broth the way I do it. So then still you have a delicious cooked beef in addition. I just okay. rinse it in water. Fantastic. You are just explaining it in so uh, many uh, details and so clearly. So I suppose it is not your first experience. And as far as I know, you even had a restaurant with... Uh, yes, I did. And uh, frankly, uh, uh, with, my, with the partner I had there, uh, we are considering not a restaurant, but an online delicatessen venture. Mm -hmm. So we are working on a startup. So yes, this does not go away. I started preparing food when I was 14 years old because my mom wouldn't want to make Christmas cookies in August and this is where I really needed them. So this is how I became the baker in the family for all cakes and biscuits and then I started to cook. So I love it. I love the process. Uh, I love having guests. I love to eat. Uh, not only healthy food. And so, <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, what are we doing next? Yeah, now we will do the Schöber because we've got time, you know. This stuff here is cooking. Actually, what I still what I'm thinking I could do before, because this soup is hotter than I thought it would be. I will show you it's much more sense. I'll show you the finishing parts for the soup for the okay. broth. For the broth, okay. Right. Now, to finish the broth, we assume that we have cooked this for at least two hours. Yeah. The beef is soft and tender, yeah? Yes. Now, um, you uh, put in the root vegetables. Celeriac, yellow uh, carrots, you can choose also others and try. Parsley root and, and, and carrots. You can also use lilac carrots and so, but yeah. that's a standard stuff. Now, all you have to do, I, I will do that here brief, quickly. You have to peel them just with, I have a, you know, a normal peeler. Yeah. You're but just you peeling it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you peel it, you don't cut it. Yeah, you cook them whole. Okay. And, and you will cook them about for another half an hour. Why? Because you want to, to, to then cut them and put them in the soup. Okay. To eat them with the soup. So I just cut the ends off and I throw these guys in there. Yeah. So you, you leave it in the soup and you eat uh, all these vegetables uh, in the soup. You eat the, you can, you can have a very nice soup where you can have some, some beef and the root vegetables, the broth, and then you add, you know, some, like I do, some biscuits or some pancakes. So it, it, it is a meal on its own, really. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Main, then it becomes a main dish. Yeah. Even if you don't do the tafel spitz. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, uh, and this is, this is a carrot or what is it in your uh, hand? It's a parsley root. Ah, it's we, a parsley. We really use the whole parsley. Mm. We use the leaves, the stems and the root. Okay. Just, you, you buy them separately. Yeah. You, but mm -hmm. the whole plant. Yeah. Okay. And this is a carrot. Yeah. So, in you go. So if we can uh, also start with discussing some more serious or even very private issues. So you have shared with us some photos of you. If you do not mind, uh, can you, I think you can, uh, 
uh, cook and and uh, talk yes, yes. because you have an experience yeah, yeah? I, I yeah. cannot explain the, the, what I cook and talk about the photos but I, <laughs> I cook and talk okay we can, yeah I'm a lawyer how do you stop a lawyer talking <laughs> it's Wait. impossible you are right so and what about the situation in Austria now with all these pandemic uh, um, pandemic uh, events and stories are the people still locked down isolated or the oh, doors lock. are opening now the lockdown was lifted uh, that doesn't mean that everything goes so there is still the basic rule of one meter distance and wearing mask whenever you enter uh, let's say a building yeah okay, okay. Um, schools will open soon universities stay shut and okay. uh, churches have opened, but again with distance rules, masks, so uh, the, the, the general precautions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sort of the practical side, I would say, on the more civil society side or political side, there is luckily a bit of a discussion uh, to make sure that the government does not think this is a good idea to control the people better. Yeah. You are right. You are right. There are a lot it's of discussions on that. Place. Yeah. For the good of everybody. So, but sort of on a, on, a, on a medical level, that is the situation, right? So. Yeah. And how does this, uh, how did this uh, situation, pandemic situation, change your arbitrator's life? Uh, uh, do, did you have or do you have uh, much more uh, virtual sessions, hearings, how the parties use these uh, tools and facilities uh, often or not so much? The technical uh, issue now is I will need my key, my mixer for a few minutes to prepare the shovel. I don't know how disturbing it is on your end. Oh, no, no, it's okay. You hear me? I, I can speak loud, so that would be the problem. Uh, it's okay. I can hear you very well. I hope the audience as well. Now, I, I will break three eggs and I will answer your question. Okay. Uh, as far as, as I remember, you just guided us uh, in the receipts uh, uh, that it is probably better to mix the eggs uh, with um, just frog, but not with the mixer. Sorry? Uh, you just, uh, uh, so you just instructed us that it is probably better to, uh, to mix the eggs with fork, but not with the mixture. Sorry, that goes to the eggs for the Wiener Schnitzel. Ah, okay, okay. Now I put the shirbal. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. So, so here I, we can I, use. I separate, yeah. We can I use separate, the mixer. Yeah, I separate. Yeah, that I do with the mixer. I separate three eggs. You know, separate the egg white and the egg yolk to start with. One, mm -hmm. two, three, and uh, how has my arbitrator situation changed? Well. It is more a coincidence that I did not have many hearings in, in this period. We, I, we, we scheduled two hearings only. And uh, indeed, we, we did not have a case management conference which we would have in, had had in person. So uh, we either did video or audio. I mean, I had, in the meantime, I had one hearing in Vienna. But I just, uh, I just had made like, a, you know, a transparent box on three sides. Okay. And, uh, the right size for my notebook, my coffee, and my papers. And so I was peacefully sitting there. Okay. And the others were wearing masks at a certain point in time, they agreed to take them off. <laughs> which oh, okay. Really yeah. the of mine because I was protected. Yeah. And so. Uh, so I'm sorry, I just mentioned you, you uh, just made the eggs so professionally. You just separated yolk and white eggs, just very professionally and now you are mixing i've done it a few thousand times <laughs> <laughs> okay okay <laughs> yeah and what about the parties uh, are they just uh, well welcoming these new tools the odr i mean online dispute resolutions so what platforms are more usable uh, what do you think about it yeah, I find uh, I find there are there is a, a, a reasonable sense of cooperation, yeah, yeah. and uh, and uh, understanding. So uh, I I have I mean, 
I, I was indirectly involved in one case, which is not a masterpiece, where the problem was that the arbitral tribunal I was not a member of um, decided to have a video conference of witnesses without making sure the environment in which the witness testifies, which is not a good idea. Yeah. Especially if you have one party insisting that there should be somebody there. And so to, that to me is just, you know, but it happens everywhere. There can be bad management, but normally uh, I find this is very smooth. I mean, I have cases in the airline industry where uh, there are settlement negotiations going on. Yeah, yeah. So if you could show us then, uh, what do you have as a result of this mixture? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. This is how it looks like at the moment. So it's, it's butter and egg. Okay. Like this. Now, um, I will add, I will add, uh, I have prepared some milk, warm milk, you know, not boiling. Uh -huh. And I just add a, a tablespoonful, not much, just a little bit. How much fat should it have, this milk? Oh, it's normal milk with about three and a half percent. Okay, okay. Uh, are you putting the milk to the uh, eggs and butter? Mixture. Yes, I put okay. it with the mixture. Uh, then uh, I put in uh, the flour and I put in some nutmeg. Uh -huh. so, here we go, this is the nutmeg, you know, okay. and I just grate it with a grater, you know, a few times again. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of taste. If you don't like nutmeg, don't do it. <laughs> so it could be also without uh, nutmeg, yeah? You can do it without nutmeg. It, it gives a nice sort of background taste, but as I said, it's not a, it, it works without this way. So this is the flour, just plain flour. Mm -hmm. yeah. I put it in and I mix again. All together, yes? Yes. Oh, it just takes a moment. Okay. So I will show just for a while to the audience yes. the uh, list of ingredients for uh, the what? other three yes. dishes. Mm -hmm. Just simply. Oh, yes. to, very good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it is very good because you just showed it. Uh, yeah. shown it and now we can see what do we have. I skip for the while this list of ingredients for Wiener Schnitzel, we will have a time to discuss it and yeah, now yeah, we just... To, to explain, I will now put in the, the cheese which is Parmesan in my case and I choose prosciutto, you can also use cooked ham or anything else as I said okay. and I'll mix it in and afterwards I'll beat the egg, egg whites, yeah? Uh-huh. Get the trick with egg whites in general you may know it or not, you use about one third of the beaten egg whites and okay. you really mix it in hard. Mm -hmm. And the remainder you fold in softly. Okay. And it mixes much better. Yeah? And how thick should it be this mixed uh, white yeah. egg? The, the general mistake of non-professionals is to beat egg whites and actually liquid cream too long. Uh -huh. It should, when you turn your pot where you mix it, it should stay in. So it should make nice uh, sort of nice little heads when you pull out the mixer, but don't overbeat it because then you want air in there. And if you beat it too long, you, you beat the air out of it again. <laughs> yeah, it's like a secret how to cook it. Yeah, interesting. So let's mix this finally and then I'll do the egg whites. So please go on with the ingredients. Okay. So you just mixed all ingredients uh, that are necessary, that are needed for ham cheese shabbat biscuits. Yes, now they're all mixed together. Mm -hmm. Now I have to beat the egg whites. Egg whites take fat. So I change the mixer and I use another bowl. Yeah. Okay. Otherwise you would have to wash in between, which is very inconvenient, right? So. Mm -hmm. Just take, uh, this is how it looks like now. You can see the pieces of prosciutto. You can't see the parmesan. This yes, I can right. see it, yeah. So I have put in the eggs in another bowl, which happens to be glass. And I put in a pinch of salt. This helps 
uh, the, the, the beaten egg whites to be more solid, right? Okay. And why do you need the glass bowl for that? Well, because I have a glass bowl and a metal bowl. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay this is not something like a uh, cooking secret. <laughs> so I will beat it. Now, beating egg yolks, there is also one thing. You should start with a middle speed. So here on my, on my thing, I use about two thirds of the maximum speed until they turn white. Only then I beat them at maximum level and then I pull it back to two thirds. Yeah. <laughs> so that will be done soon and then it will go in the oven and we are done with it. And then we will finish the potato salad. Fantastic. So this means that we did simultaneously at least three dishes. Practically. Yeah, we, we will make it. I mean, I okay. have a board hanging in my kitchen. You can't see it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So if you do not mind, if you could just make a very little small pause for break, we uh, could um, just see some of your photos that you shared with us. Uh, that are very interesting. Ah, the photos, yeah. The photos, yeah. <laughs> well, this is me, I mean, this is in my, I grew up in Salzburg, yeah, and in a, in a house together with my, with one of my grandparents and my family. And I'm no longer into gardening, but then obviously I was. I still remember this thing. Okay. Uh, and uh, and uh, that was a very nice childhood. So uh, I was always busy. Uh, my mother said three bags of fleas would be easier. Yeah. Uh, a bit later, I was a constant patient at the ambulance around the corner because I used to just fly anywhere you could go <laughs> and hurt myself. <laughs> so I just wanted to say this is your probably first uh, first hobby, just working in a garden, yes? Uh, or my, my grandfather looked after the garden and it was nice to be with him. I guess that was the major motivation. My father was in private practice, so I would see him on weekends. Uh -huh. And this one, this photo. Uh, that, uh, my, my parents had the habit, I mean, my father insisted to go on holiday alone with his wife, no kids. I, I, since I have kids, I understand him. Before I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, but I, <laughs> I, I take my holidays with my kids, but that was the only holiday, I'm about 12 here, that I took with my parents in Italy on the Riviera. Uh -huh. And this is actually where I learned to swim, I, because I nearly died about the age of the first photo, because uh -huh. I, I slipped and fell into a lake. And uh -huh. it was a matter of a second or two that I got rescued. Otherwise, I would have, it's a very deep lake, I would have just gone. And so I was extremely afraid of water. My father was a committed swimmer. So there were 10 years of drama um, trying to get me to swim. And then I met, you know, chap, other chaps of my age. Uh, it was the sea and then I didn't care. And just, so this is where I started swimming. So, uh, fantastic. So this is what you like to, I mean, I mean swim. I love swimming now. I really love yeah. swimming. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, moving to one more very interesting and impressive photo um, oh, yeah, that, yeah, that, that I have. Is this a show jumping or...? That is show jumping, yeah. Okay. I, mainly, I mainly competed in dressage, but as you see, I also did some show jumping. There I am, 19 years old, 19, 20 years old, and I was wearing a moustache. Ah, <laughs> yeah, I see. I see them. <laughs> And was it a sport or was it a hobby? Neither. It was a, a philosophy of life for me to be in the saddle. Yeah? Okay. And, and it was until very recently I had, uh, I had a major horse incident in October where I, I, when lying on the floor I realized this is bad. Yeah? Uh, because uh, my arm would move on its own, the leg wouldn't work. And mm -hmm. the only thing I checked is whether I could feel my toes and my fingers, and I did. So from that point onwards, I was only grateful that I'm not paraplexic. Awesome. And so um, I, I will in all likelihood not take up riding again. It was, it, was, it was wonderful decades of my life. But then it takes lots of time and energy, and there are other interesting things in life as well. So um, I, I, I took it as a good turn, nothing else. So... So does it mean that you probably found it out some new hobbies or, or sports for you for now? 
Well, not really sports. I mean, I, I was for a long time interested to, to understand what Tai Chi is. And I've, of course, you can't take Tai Chi lessons now, but I, I found, first of all, a very good introduction by Harvard Medical School into Tai Chi. And then I, I you know, I just uh, subscribed online to a very good Tai Chi teacher. And so I, I, you know, I'm in front of the screen and I try to make movements that somehow look like the ones on the screen. <laughs> That's one of the things, yeah. If I may just ask you to show us uh, what do you have now? Uh, what is this? Is exactly the result of all these mixtures for biscuit? And I mixed in while we were talking. I mixed in the beaten egg whites. Yeah, and mm -hmm. now I will show you afterwards. I will spread it about a finger thick on mm -hmm. a baking uh, tray uh, covered with a, a with a baking paper. Yeah, with a parchment paper. Okay. It's very easy to take off and it will go in an oven at about 220 degrees, a bit more, for roughly 10 minutes until it's nicely golden brown. You should not over bake it. Mm -hmm. That's another general mistake when you, when you bake things. Don't bake them too long. Uh, test them and take them out straight when they, when they, when they solidified. Yeah? Uh -huh. Okay. Like also if I do sweet cakes, uh, you, you use a metal, a, a little metal uh, metal stick, and uh, not metal, a wooden stick is better. Wooden stick, yeah. Wooden mm -hmm. stick, you, you will know it. You, you try, and then when it's sort of getting ready, you try sort of every few minutes. You see it's still moist and something sticks on it. You wait a few minutes, and the moment it's done, out of it. Yeah, get it out of the oven. Yeah. No more additional test is needed, yes? Just no, no, sit no, 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 no. Take it out, yeah? yeah to take it out. Okay. And do we do we need oven only for cooking biscuits or also for yes, some other that's the only no that's the only that's the only purpose of the oven. Now this is what I've done. You can see uh -huh. the finger thick. Hmm. Now I'll shoot it into the oven and uh, that's basically the end of this one as well. Uh-huh. Okay. So now we turn back to our potato salad. Okay. We have to finish the potato salad. And I don't, I try to show you, I try to show you. This is sort of, you know, it's a rather, I don't know whether you can see it, but it is already very thick, yeah? Yes, we can see it very good. It's, it's, yeah. Yeah. yeah? Mm -hmm. Now, um, this is an old recipe from the 19th century because normally, you would add, which I will later, red onions, and this would be it, salt and pepper. Oh. But um, here, there are other things that come in. They are obviously on the ingredients thing. It's anchovy paste and yes. tarragon mustard. There is uh, boiled egg yolk. There is white wine vinegar and sunflower oil. Mm -hmm. That all I put together and then I salt it. And I have to fetch the pepper, which is back there. So I just for a moment change the pots to half the one I'm ready. To so you need them to have some more pl place, yes, some more space for it. Space for the schnitzels because they are not far away. Okay. So, um, just need the pepper, sorry. Uh huh. Okay, here we go. Uh, do you need the pepper make... for, you, you need, uh, do you need the pepper for what? For, oh, I see. Um, I, I put it with the, with the, the white wine vinegar, the sunflower oil, the cooked egg yolk, the tarragon mustard, and the anchovy paste. It's for the sauce. And now I make a paste, yeah, with a fork. Yeah. Okay. So it takes a bit of time, but uh, it's not so complicated. You can also use anchovy fillets. It's just the paste uh, molds in much much easier. You see, it's yeah. a nice green yes, sauce. Yeah. And then you mix under the potatoes. Mm -hmm. So, and you just you just mix it in. No you are mixing it in, yeah. Just mix mm -hmm. it with what you have. And now you add, it's important, red onions, not white ones, not yellow ones. You, you should use red onions. Okay. Should you slice it? Yeah, finely cut. 
Us. Candy cup, tiny little cubes. Mm -hmm. Just kick them in. You mix it and you should not cool it. Uh-huh. Serve it cool. Yeah. I mean, if you have to keep it overnight, you have to put it in the fridge, but make sure you take it out early enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It should be at least room temperature. It can oh. even be a bit warmer. This is still warm and ideally. Uh, if I had guests now, they would get it in like uh, half an hour at the latest. It would still be warm. Mm -hmm. Then the best, yeah? So, okay. this is finished. <laughs> so, this is, re is, is this ready, right? We have done it. Sorry? We have done it. The potato salad is, is ready. Fantastic. It is. It's ready to, okay, perfect. <laughs> Probably we move back yes. for some more photos uh, that we have from you. Another two. I just put them into one slide, but... Well, it uh, is about sort of being a table, cooking. This is an essential part of my life. I mean, you are talking to me here from my new home. Yeah. It's a house in Vienna I've owned for a long time, which has been liberated from the tenants I was considering back and forth. And now, quite shortly, I've decided to move in. I will, I will refurbish it completely. But, um, but you know, then uh, when you move to a new place, you, you, you see objectively who you are. And it's full of books after two weeks. It's full of cooking utensils <laughs> and full of food. <laughs> <laughs> So the obviously essentials of my life. All what you like and yes, all, all, all what you need for your life, yeah. And another one, just very interesting and impressive, yeah. So I saw you several times uh, in any events in Austria in such an Austrian traditional suit, yeah. Uh, I, I, I know that Austrian people like this tradition to, to be dressed to wear the traditional suits, but this is not an Austrian one. Where not is a, it? Not an Austrian one, it is a Scottish one. Yeah. It is the, the, the Scottish dinner jacket called Prince Charlie jacket. Uh -huh. Prince Charlie was the last count who unsuccessfully tried to get rid of the English. And so in his memory as the last Scottish hero who failed, this is called a Prince Charlie jacket. You wear it with a kilt, the kilt uh, but when I, I mean, this is a long dream of me to wear a kilt. Yeah, when I was 20, I wanted to own a kilt. I thought this is stupid. I turned older, and then I decided um, I'm old enough for a little quirks. And I went to a shop here of a guy who is married to a Scottish girl, and so he sells this stuff. And I said, listen, if I buy this, am I the only fool in Austria? And he said, no, no, no. It's quite, you know, there are quite a few people who like it. So I got it and I inquired with the Royal Tartan Society because I didn't want to be killed by clan members if I wear their tartan. And he said, there are the only rule for wearing a tartan is you wear it with dignity as a man. And I said, that's my intention, so no problems. But this is actually Black Mountain Watch. It, uh -huh. is, the, it is the tartan of the first Scottish infantry regiment, the, the elite regiment of the Scots. Uh, but I, I didn't choose it for that, but I think it is a nice sort of discreet color. And yeah. uh, sort of, um, obviously the question is why, why that? And my clear answer is I do have Scottish ancestry, which I can conclude by the fact that this stuff just fits me as if I was born in it and it feels like it, yeah? And then if I may add, I mean, this photo was funny because people look at you, right? And I mean, there is this obvious question in everybody's mind, yeah? yeah. What do you wear underneath? And so, so there was a chap passing by and he stopped and I said, hello. And he said, hello, uh, what do you wear underneath? And I said, <laughs> come and have a look yourself. So he fled. And <laughs> <laughs> actually uh, there, there are two options. And the, the one I choose is called the commander's option, which is you wear nothing underneath. Uh -huh. The only advice I would give to everybody who would go to a ball in this, uh, this happened to me on my first ball with my then girlfriend. I, I like to dance and I was turning around very fast. This kilt flies wonderfully. It has lots of plates, right? Yeah. And so she said, could you please turn slower because you're horizontal. <laughs> so, yeah, probably it, it so doesn't it fit to Austrian ball to, to, to any Vienna ball. <laughs> but this is 
my, my, the moths actually have attacked all my other formal clothes. I had everything. This is the only one they have not touched. And, and this is the only formal cloth you would see me um, at, the, at the festivity. Okay, thank you. Thank you for this story. <laughs> thank you very much. Story, yes. <laughs> yeah. So, where we are with our cooking? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Now, I'm a bit stuck with this bugger, but it doesn't matter because we will turn to the... Actually, I can show you because, as you may guess, now this is the biscuit, right? Miraculously finished. Uh -huh. <laughs> Okay, so you cut it however you know I cut it like little diamonds. This is tradition. Mm -hmm. Cut it in any way you want, yeah. Okay. And actually, they are not bad. I find either for you know nibbling with some wine or so or some beer. Yeah, you don't have to put them in the soup. They are relatively dry. Is it soft like a biscuit? It is soft like a biscuit. It's a bit dry. Mm -hmm. It's not moist, moist, so you need something to drink with it, but. If you eat it, I mean, it also goes with vodka, I'm sure. I think you're frozen at the moment, so I wait. <laughs> so. You're back. Because you were frozen, I was not sure whether uh, we lost the connection completely. So. Um, I said, it, um, um, they, they also, I've tested it, they, they work nice with vodka as well. <laughs> Very good. But, uh, but, but, but for Wiener Schnitzel, uh, as, you, as you recommended, uh, the dry Riesling uh, goes as a best, I, I don't know, best drink. I mean, mm -hmm. sorry, I dumped the, the spoons in the... In the clarified butter. I put the clarified butter now on the oven. But the spoon is not uh, <laughs> in our list of ingredients. <laughs> Sorry? The spoon is not in the list of ingredients for that. <laughs> so I heat it up um, and we turn to the schnitzels. Okay. Uh, so this is the main dish, but we do it as a fourth step of our cooking today. Yeah, I mean, because on the broth, I will just quickly tell you because it's a bit boring to watch. The broth will be finished soon, the, 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 the ready one, with where I have put the root vegetables in, yeah? Mm -hmm. And it's very simple. All you do is you take the meat out, not the bones. You take the root vegetables out, the root vegetables, and then you just strain what is in there, right? So you take out the parsley bunch and the leek and the spices and the, and the bones. And then you put it back together. And then you've okay. got your broth with nice meat and nice roots. Yeah? Mm. So okay. that's how you finish it. So, and then, of course, you can season it to your liking. Okay. Uh, but usually the way it's prepared, it, you don't need any seasoning because it's so tasty because of this mixture. And the bones are important. Without the bones, you don't get the taste. Without the black burnt onions, you, get the, you don't get the taste. A bunch of so all is important, but it melts together into something which is what the English call comfort food. Yeah, this so. is the same. This is the same like in arbitration. Yes, if we compare just cooking and arbitration, there are a lot of uh, similarities. Yeah, in that. Well, I have a, I have a point to make on that. Um, I just get an egg and show you what you mentioned before. Don't use a mixer. Yeah. I just have to be careful about the clarified, I use clarified butter for the schnitzel. You could use any cooking oil, try, I mean, it's the same like ghee in India, actually. Yeah, uh -huh. you could ghee, yeah. Um, it is important that it's not too cold and not too hot. So if you had a thermometer, it would be about 170 degrees. An easy test is you take a fork, you put it briefly into water and you put it in the oil. And if it starts to sizzle benevolently, you're at the right point. Yeah? Okay. Okay. So I get an egg and then we'll do the schnitzels. Okay. And I'll tell you about the cooking and arbitration. Okay, great. And in particular, I would refer to the, to the position as an arbitrator, which is the only thing I do for the past years. I have not forgotten my life as a manager and as a client and as a counselor, but yeah. this is what I do. So, I have um, put just the egg as it is, you know, yolk. Okay, the full egg, the yolk. I will, I will, yes, I will, I will salt it a bit, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I'll put just a tiny bit of water in it. To the egg? Yeah, into the egg. 
Uh, just because warm it, or cold? Warm or cold? Uh, about what? One or two tablespoons. Yeah, uh, sh should be water. the water. Should it be cold or warm? It doesn't matter. Okay. It does not matter. And now I use a fork. Yes. Just to beat it like that. Be careful not to. If you have many eggs, you can be more violent. But uh, <laughs> if you want to keep the egg in, uh, you should watch yeah. it. It needs a bit of practice, but you get it quickly yeah. and you can turn around. So that's about it. You know, just that it is a, 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 a yeah. homogeneous mixture. Okay. okay. So I have two more plates. The one is flour. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the other one is dried breadcrumbs. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. So the only thing I have to do before we start the schnitzel is I have to liberate the oven because you, you, ha you have to bake one schnitzel after the other and you keep them warm in the open oven at the 100 degrees. Yeah? Okay. Until so ready you, to you, you cook each slice separately. That's my advice, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. You can use a larger pan and do more together. There is no harm. You have to be very attentive doing it. Mm -hmm. And you have a much better control if you just uh, do one after the other. And it depends how many people you have. If you've got a crowd of 20, uh, you'll be old. So you will use a, a large pan. Lots of fat. The schnitzel must swim, so you need at least this deep in fat. It must swim in the fat, not touch the ground. Okay. That's key. Otherwise, no way to get a proper schnitzel. Mm -hmm. Get a proper schnitzel. A proper schnitzel. You and the, o the, the oven, you just only use it for keeping the schnitzel, each slice of schnitzel warm, right? Now, yes, I used it also for the biscuit. Uh -huh. Now its only purpose is to keep the schnitzel warm until it's served, yeah? Mm -hmm. And not make it go soggy, yeah? Yeah. So I'll do it step by step and obviously I will not, I, I make just two, I make two schnitzels, yeah? Yeah. Again, for the sake of time, so. When cooking, you, you could uh, just tell us about uh, your first experience as an arbitrator, yeah? Do you yes, remember? I, I, I still owe you an answer, and uh, which is cooking and arbitration. I think there are two two answers to that. Yeah. The one is uh, as an arbitrator, I find uh, the parallels. You have to know exactly what you want to do and what your goal is, and you have to do it uh, with understanding, softly, without force. That is good cooking, and that is good arbitrating. Yeah. There is a second aspect I happen to have just uh, published in the Journal of International Arbitration, an article, which is called um, Arbitration as Teamwork, which may strike people as completely ludicrous. Uh, as having a have been in business, I have business studies, and I, I thought, why not try to see what happens if you apply that framework? And it is most interesting. And one element is the environment you create for a team. And it is a team in the end. I mean, I, I, I won't, uh, you can read the article. But food is not to be underestimated. And I always considered it, uh, if nobody else did, but when I was chair, no assistant would, 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 would look after the food for lunch. It was my job. I would test it, I would decide it. And typically, like I had a Polish-Italian uh, arbitration, it would be a mixed buffet, Polish, Italian, or maybe Polish, Austrian, Italian. Our life is short. And I think it may even assist in a more efficient dialogue when you have these common moments together. But in any case, because life is short, better to spend one hour lunch in a nice atmosphere than not. That's my simple truth. Yeah, you're right. As first arbitration. Uh -huh. So uh, let me just briefly talk about the Wiener Schnitzel. Um, yes, yes, please. First thing first, <laughs> I, will, I will show you in the camera because I'm, I'm a bit low here with my work top, but uh, we'll yes, get... Yes, there are, there, there are uh, also some, some special tips for how to do it, yes. Absolutely, yeah. They're very yes. important, simple things, again, as I said in the beginning, but you follow them. Now, the advice is, I mean, I don't like cling film too much. I, I don't hate plastic. It's a, it's a, it's a brilliant invention. It's just... Uh, used too much and, and discarded in the wrong way. So you use cling film 
to mm -hmm. cover your board, which is a typical sort of wooden board, but not a simple one where you can really beat on it. Okay. And we will this what is I do. Strong. Is this strong one, yeah? But it's a strong one made of little uh, squares, yeah, glued together. So it's really strong, yeah. Okay. You don't put the wood along this line, but you know, the other line. So yeah. it's really nice. Yeah. Okay. It's like you cut the tree, yeah? Yeah, okay. This is, this is a bit small, but you know, it's up to taste. I prefer smaller schnitzels and more of them uh, than, than big schnitzels. They're also easier to handle, yeah? Okay. So, so I, I, I use two. I put them on the cling film. Uh -huh. The next thing you do is important, if I can find my knife. <laughs> Doesn't matter, I've got enough knives. So, you cut it a bit, mm -hmm. cut it a bit along the edge, one, one centimeter, oh, okay. like this, yeah? Otherwise, when it, when it turns hot, it'll roll up, Jup, yeah? Yeah. So you cut uh -huh. it a bit, you know, every couple of centimeters, a cut of a centimeter. That's quickly done. Mm -hmm. And using the cling film basically sort of keeps matters cleaner because, you know, with meat you have to be very careful for hygienic reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have to use the cling film if you hate it. <coughs> you just have to check. This is a very strong hot plate. So now I, I show you, I cover it with a clean film. Mm -hmm. And now it is very important, I use a mallet to beat it, but one with a straight surface. Mm -hmm. There are lots which have little hooks, forget them, don't use them. They, I don't know who invented them, a criminal, yeah? <laughs> for the meat, for the schnitzel. Uh -huh. I use the flat stuff. And beat it a bit. I mean, you don't, you know. How long are you doing this? If you come back from a long day, a long hearing, it may be a good way sort of to... <laughs> it's very good. Not, not very long. I mean, yeah. like I have done. That's all, yeah? Good anti-stress exercise. That's a bit of an exercise. Right. So, I've not forgotten your question about my first arbitration. Um, salt is here. So, now I salt them. Yeah. On one side, yeah, and I'll show you again in a second how this goes. So I've sorted them. So I've sorted one side. I take the flour and mm -hmm. put it into the flour with the sorted side down, and now I sort the top side. Uh -huh. okay. Yeah. And now I, I turn it around. I don't sort of push it hard. I just make sure that it's completely covered with flour. And important, I slightly shake off the flour. Okay. Now comes the egg. Mm -hmm. and basically, same procedure. I put it in. You can also use a fork if you want to keep clean hands. Okay. You take it out, you shake it a bit. Yeah. Okay. And then the dried breadcrumbs, same procedure. Yeah. Put it in. You make sure that it's properly covered by all sides. Okay. You can tap it a bit, but not strong. And again, shake off any crumbs. Now you can't see that I cannot lift the man. I put it in the hot clarified butter. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether you can hear a sizzling. Yes, we can see it. We can see it, yeah. May actually just quickly. We can, oh, uh, yes, so it is better. We can see it quite good, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it is quite enough full of uh, flour. It's, it's swimming nicely, yeah. And one important thing is don't do them in advance, the schnitzels. Do one after the other, you see? I put it in, I watch over this one. I don't start the second one, yeah? yeah. Because if you make them all at once and let them wait, they turn soggy. Okay, if yeah. you want nice, Red crust on the schnitzel. Yeah. Now this doesn't take long. This is a three, four minute exercise. Yeah. So very. No, we, so we do have, so to say, three layers coat, and we cook it one after another. You cook it one after another, and it's still too hot. Uh huh. And so I turn it over very carefully. Yeah. Uh huh. The interesting thing is I, I trained with the other hot plate, which is obviously cooler than this one. So it is a bit too dark. 
Yes. Yeah, it is definitely too dark, but I think this is nice when we real life thing. Uh -huh. I mean, this is too dark, yeah? Okay. It should be more golden. I've turned down the heat. Now what I do, I use uh, some kitchen paper. Uh -huh. I put a dish in the oven because it has excess fat you have to get rid of, yeah? Yeah. I put it on the kitchen paper, both sides, yeah? And I let it sit in the oven and wait. Now I wait a bit for the fat to cool down a bit. And my first arbitration, um, actually my first arbitration I had was as a sole arbitrator. I had not had any arbitration before as counsel. <laughs> <laughs> I had been away from Austria, <coughs> I emigrated from Austria, left the legal profession, uh, done an MBA uh, in, in, in INSEAD in Fontainebleau and then went into the business and was, was uh, managing uh, in high relatively high positions in, in, in a few European companies. And when I came back to Austria and back to the law, um, the ICC Austria had changed their head and he, I mean, he's still in place today, Max burger -Shedny. He was deliberately looking for new blood. And so I get a phone call one day and said, would you like to sit as an arbitrator? Now, arbitration has fascinated me since my law studies. And so I said, sure. And he said, fine. So I got a small case, which I, I guess nobody wanted to take because it was um, Slovak law. French was the language of the arbitration and the documents were in Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> and it was about a casino license in Slovakia in 93. <laughs> Very good case, good matter. <laughs> So that was my first case and I sort of, I, I think I sort of managed somehow. <laughs> yeah, interesting. Oh, I, will, I will now do just a second schnitzel and see whether I can save my armor uh, by showing you how it should look like. <laughs> so I do, I do the same procedure. I've sorted one side, I put it in the flour, I sort the other side. I turn it around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just make sure that there is everything covered. So as you said, three layers, layer number one. Yes. I mean, there are four because you have to sort it, so, okay. Yeah. Egg is the second. Cover it completely with egg. Shake off the excess. Yeah. Put it in the dry breadcrumbs. Shake off the excess and in we go. Yeah, that looks better. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> so I, I will watch over it. I would like to show you how a proper schnitzel looks like. Yeah. <laughs> and when you turn it round very carefully, don't break the cover. So I use, I, I mean, it doesn't matter, four spoons, I use two. And like if I lift it like a baby and okay. turn it round. Turn it only once. It needs about two hours on each side, not more. The meat will stay soft and juicy. The bread crumb cover is crisp. Uh-huh, so. Yeah, this is much more like it. We're getting so? there, I'll show you, I'll show you. <laughs> you can cover a little bit uh, down that we could see it. I'll show you in a moment. Yeah. Uh-huh. Well, I haven't taken the fat off, but that doesn't matter. So this is like it should look like, more or less. Okay. Yes. And I already added the lemon, which goes with it. Yeah. So this is about yes, how it see it. Yeah. This is a right color, yes? Yes, golden. It shouldn't be dark on the edges. <coughs> And you, as you see, you have to test it. Even one hot plate may act differently than the other, as I've just experienced. Yeah. With my, but I'm, I'm not used to the oven because I didn't live here. So um, still, <coughs> it is worth, it is also worth, um, you know, trying dishes uh, more than once, obviously, mm -hmm. to find your way, yeah? Yeah. The meat you buy may be different. The breadcrumbs you may buy at your place may be, may have more water content or less. The flour is different for sure, yeah? Yeah. So there are tiny little differences which make a difference. So yeah. 
Try things out. If they don't work to your total liking the first time, take it as every failure, which is a great resource. Yeah, yeah. So if we, could, if we can move to some serious things a bit, because we are practically well, ready with our- The rest is easy. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, the rest is easy. So uh, I just prepared some um, some slides. Yes. Uh, this is some statistics, uh, VR yes. statistics. Uh, wow. As we can see, the new cases filed uh, for the recent 10 years approximately, they are practically on this same stable uh, level. Um, regarding the number of the cases. Uh, we also see the amount um, in aggregate uh, in disputes for the same period of time, which is um, going down. Um, I'm not sure whether the number of cases or the average amount uh, in dispute the, the, that or, or this is more important, but what uh, do you think, what drivers could uh, uh, just help to, uh, to to make these figures growing for the beer for the Austrian uh, place of arbitration. Yes, um, of course I can only guess because if I knew, uh, <laughs> um, <coughs> first of all, I am. I mean, as we all know, there are no overall statistics of arbitration cases. Uh, if if you count the number of participants in, con in conferences about arbitration, I don't think they're a fair reflection of the number uh, of cases that are around. Um, but still Vienna, I think, has, uh, has, uh, has a, a place which could be higher than the one it has. How can it achieve that? I think to me, <coughs> as we know in practice, there are lots of considerations why one would put in one arbitration clause or another yeah and there may be habits i mean as as we all know sort of there is a clear tendency among many russian parties to go to london um for whatever reasons uh, that may be i mean if you don't have english law that that's okay if you have english law then i don't know who would ever do this yeah, yeah. because it's just, uh, nothing against english law it's a brilliant system but it's just immensely costly um, so um, I think Austria um, has developed, but not sort of for a sufficiently long time, a pool of arbitrators, an increasing pool of good, ambitious arbitrators. But there was sort of maybe a, a generation gap. Yeah. Um, there are sort of I may I, I'm sort of I mean sort of, I'm not young obviously. But I am sort of, I was sort of among the first to join a new, a new wave of arbitration in Austria. Yeah. Behind there was nobody really. There were a few guys yeah, handling Austrian arbitrations, uh, not visible on the international field. Yeah. yeah. It says this takes time to change and to show your presence. That is one thing. Um, we will come to the, to the legal framework, I think. So I will not touch on this. Yeah. And uh, in the end, it is a question of uh, how much you put into marketing. I mean, if I uh, may briefly tell an old Jewish joke, there is Mrs. Cohn on the market with beautiful apples, but they're all there. And the rabbi comes by and says, how are you, Mrs. Cohn? And she says, well, I'm healthy and the kids are healthy, but, but nobody's buying my apples. And the rabbi says, would you mind if I just take two of your apples? And he disappears. And uh, half an hour later, she's sold out. So she wonders what miracle has the rabbi worked. She follows the rabbi and there she sees him in a little street, an apple in each of his hand and he says, beautiful apples, quickly buy them if they're still there at Mrs. Cohn. So she jumps to the rabbi and says, rabbi, what are you doing? He says, Mrs. Cohn, you have wonderful apple, nobody knew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that is that would be my, my advice. Now, the problem is that uh, in a way, the advantage of the problem of VIAG is it is it's not unusual, part of the Austrian state organization, the Chamber of Commerce. And it is, it is like a bureaucracy, yeah? because as an entrepreneur, you're obliged to be a member, not like in Germany yeah? or in other countries. So they work like a ministry. Okay? 
and arbitration is a strange thing for them. Yeah, so they don't invest. That's the key problem. In my view, they don't invest into the institution to allow it to send speakers around the world to be present and so on. So that is that would be my advice to the organization. I mean, advice. Yeah, they can do nothing because they have the budget. I mean. Law firms stepped in over the past years and financed marketing in their own interest, of course. So I think it's these two elements. It's, it's not sufficient resources to make yourself known and the advantages, which um, I, I still consider this position of Austria. You cannot put uh, countries on wheels and roll them around. Austria is where it is. And therefore, you will find an extraordinary high proportion of arbitrators who, let's say, understand, if I may say it like, like the Slav world of Europe and the non-Slav world of Europe. And it matters, yeah? And yeah. sort of to be this bridge function, Austrians, I think, are capable of doing it. Not all of them, but sort of, especially in this geographic context, yeah? I think they would have an advantage, yeah? Yeah. More uh, open to the different traditions of Europe, yeah, mainly. Yeah. Yes, and Austria is exactly in the center of Europe, just connecting both sides, yeah, uh, different cultures, yeah. yeah. So, and what about uh, uh, some potential in the nature, in the types of disputes, yeah? I have prepared some slides, a couple of slides on this for 2016, for example, and we see the big percentage of general trade, finance, machinery and distribution, some business services, and we, are, we can see how it is developing from year to year. Uh, for example, for the next year, we see also some special uh, natures of disputes like aerospace and defense, uh, commercial service service and agriculture. Then in 2019, we see also insurance and reinsurance. Uh, could uh, VIAC and Austria be also a place for any special kind of disputes, probably even not traditional for Austria before? Yeah. I mean, I think it would, again, it, it's a question of investment. Yeah. Uh, for sure, you could consider that, uh, for example, the digital world and its particularities, yeah, would be an interesting area to get into. What does this require? Arbitrators who have the necessary non-legal knowledge about this, yeah? And, and you have to create that. It is, for, for somebody in private business, usually too difficult to create that. So theoretically, yes, uh, that's one of the areas I would see. But that would mean that in the end, the owner of VIA, the Chamber of Commerce says, we think this is interesting. We want, or the government, if we want to have a pool position in digital Europe and arbitration is part of it. Yeah. And therefore we will fund, I mean, I'm not, I'm not talking about spending money, yeah? but in an intelligent way, we will foster that. That would be my personal idea. I mean, the, the, as you see, the, the, the share of the different businesses varies a lot. And I think this is coincidental. There is no real trend, yeah? Yeah, That yeah. would be my thought, yeah? Mm -hmm. So, could we turn a little bit back just for a while to our cooking? Uh, where we are with that? With well, our schnitzel? Yeah, we are finished. Uh, it's ready that you have a bite. So, are we ready to serve it? Yes? This is, right, this is what you would have on the table. I mean, you would have two of these mm -hmm. with lemon and the potato salad. Yeah? And you would have a nice glass of Riesling with it. Yeah. Of course, it is Austrian, yeah? From Wachau, probably, or? It is indeed, yeah, it is, uh, uh, no, actually, it is uh, further north from the Wachau, this one, yeah? Okay. Wachau is the typical wine-growing country for, I mean, a few grapes, but Grüner Weltlina okay. is probably the most prominent. Mm -hmm. So, I told you your health. <laughs> yes, just cheers for <laughs> cheers. very nice cooking. But if you do not mind, probably we uh, discuss a couple more questions. Just I'm not in a hurry at all. Yeah, I wouldn't be very boring with that. But in any case, we have some more um, interesting uh, yes. just statistics figures for origin of arbitrators, origin of the parties. 
as we can see, the um, arbitrators of Austrian origin are uh, represented uh, just to 50 <coughs> or almost 60 percent when the um, origin of parties are mostly international. How could you explain this, this trend? Could it be changed in the nearest future? And what are the, um, reason, the, the, the drivers for that? I think, well, first of all, I think this is good news because it means that there is a pool of arbitrators to choose from, right? Because on the long term, I mean, if they, if they were not heads, um, you wouldn't see these figures, yeah? Mm -hmm. um, then uh, the issue is you have to distinguish, obviously, between institution appointments and party appointments, yeah? And uh, it may well, and there I speculate, it may well be, I mean, on the one hand, the agenda is an interesting as well. Um, it may be that parties, uh, when they have a VIAC arbitration, which would typically be seated in Vienna, I mean, you could choose another seat, but sort of the default seat is Vienna. Um, you may think it advisable to have an Austrian on, on the arbitral tribunal. Um, not really logical, yeah? the profile matters and uh, not so much the legal background. That is my experience, what type of arbitrator you have. But that may be a reason that sort of the parties uh, make this automatic connection and then you don't, you, you have a, a fair number of um, sophisticated participants in terms of law firms. You have a fair number of absolutely unexperienced participants. So they would logically turn, they would think in their own territorial system. Lawyers think in their jurisdiction. So that is to me an explanation why, and it would be interesting to compare that with other institutions and see whether there is a different trend. Yeah, yeah. I didn't do this, but this is just a question. This is my explanation. I don't think, um, it would be interesting to look at the institution appointments, yeah? yeah? Now it is clear if you have a case with a small value you would not want the parties to incur travel costs in addition. So that speaks in favor of appointing somebody who lives in Vienna. Yeah. yeah. Especially if you think the person has the right profile. Yeah. yeah. If the case is higher value, then it's really not an issue. Yeah. We do have um, some more figures for gender diversity, which is also a very hot topic, yeah. yes, uh, nowadays. And we can see that, for example, if we compare the um, appointments by the Board of Institution and the nominations by the parties of arbitrator, the parties of arbitrator are very reluctant just to, for example, appointing the, um, the, the female arbitrators. Uh, what is the background for that? And do you see any, any possible changes in the nearest future? Well, that depends how you define nearest future. Um, it's still a boys club among the arbitration departments if you look at the senior position. Very much so. Boys appoint boys. Yeah? I think that's a very simple truth. They will camouflage it, they will never admit to it. It is a fact to me. Yeah? And you see that there's a striking difference because the institution takes it with effort. Yeah? And there you have a completely different picture. So. There, there is, however, another problem, and I, it reminds me, I mean, McKinsey is doing a very interesting study for now over 10 years, which is called Women Matter. It, it's worth reading up. There is a, a great report every year. And, and one of the reports they've done is they've compared uh, uh, sort of large U.S. companies quoted on the stock exchange, and they split them into two groups. The one group had at least uh, one third uh, women in the first and second level of management and in addition at least three of them in absolute numbers in each level and the others had less. Clear significant change of economic performance. Not surprising at all. Yeah? And, uh, and sort of, I like, but you have the same sort of, I guess, uh, sort of beer table feelings of the guys you have in all industries, they said, I've worked hard for 15, 20 years to get there, and now I should be a woman to get a job. Yeah? Bad luck, folks. You had it for very long. Yeah? Yeah. So, uh, and, 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 and to come back to the women, because what happens, and this is my personal experience as well, if you have 
a woman alone in a male environment, she will usually turn to the worst male you can imagine. She changes her social gender to be successful. She kicks harder than the others to make it. So she loses all the advantages I see in the different ways that we see the world. So th thank you for this. Thank you for this uh, thoughts and, and view. I just had one more question just regarding the pledge, but you just, uh, I think you answer it also to it. I just only wanted to ask you whether you see any risks with this pledge campaign. It is very important that this oh. is promoting women, but uh, couldn't uh, this balance in the future, uh, this gender diversity? No, absolutely not. But I think when you talk about gender issues, and again, this is true for arbitrators, for, for counselors, and for all other professional activities. To me, it is, if, if we would not have kids that multiply in another way, like yeast, we wouldn't have the gender discussion. That is my theory. Yeah? If there wouldn't be an uneven distribution of jobs in the society, we wouldn't have the issue. Yeah? So, it is, uh, there was a very nice campaign in Austria where they sort of the social ministry, so ministry of social affairs advertised for paternity leave. And you see a father with a young chap and the heading is this time will never come back. I was lucky because of a divorce. I had and wanted to spend time with my boys and I was sending it, I, I, I was doing the normal life of any woman who is professionally active and has a family. I was cooking, I was on the phone for a telephone conference, I was trying to sort out the fight with my boys and make sure they do the homework and the schnitzel doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. you just mentioned you have multitask personality. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but as I said, this is nothing extraordinary. This is the normal life of professional women with kids. And that to me is the root cause of all these problems, yeah? And, 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 and the root cause to me is to see whether male or female, that the way you can lead your life, you have much more opportunities open to you than you realize in maybe very traditional ways of society. And I'm fully in favor of institutional measures, quota. I think this is not the only way, that is one of the ways. And yes, there may be a stupid woman on a job. How many stupid guys are there around? I know many, many. Thank you. Thank you for this answer. So, um, Christoph, we have one more just very brief topic, but uh, probably you could uh, just um, explain, you could comment uh, the yes. statistics that you provided to us about the Austrian Supreme Court's enforcement uh, practice. You just mentioned that these 17 cases, uh, they were handled during 48 years. Is it correct? Yes, that is correct. Now, there are two caveats. This is a sample, right? Because I've, I've, one of the books I've written is called The Healthy Award, and I've drawn on that because there is a, a second edition coming up soon, so I'm pretty up to date. So therefore, of course, I, 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 I choose the instructive cases under Article 5, yeah, and not sort of boilerplate ones. So that's one thing, yeah. But the boilerplate ones are, are typically granted cases, not refused cases, right? So that's one thing. The other thing is that enforcement, as opposed to the setting aside proceedings, they go straight to the Supreme Court. Enforcement does not. It goes to the, to the county court, then it goes to the Court of Appeal, then it may go to the Supreme Court, but only if there is a question of general relevance. Yeah? So you have many more enforcement cases which end lower down, but you know, you know the landscape, there are no real problems. So that it's not that you say, oh God, you know, stay away from Linz, the Court of Appeal is crazy. Not at all. Yeah? And the, the fact that in setting aside proceedings, we have a specialized Senate in the Supreme Court who gets all the setting aside and all the arbitration cases outside enforcement, which is chaired by a very able, actually female president, um, and has very good members, has done a lot to, to uh, let's say, to keep the ship on the course it had for decades, which is hands-off arbitration. Only in extreme cases get in, 
and he, he, he refers when infused to a cases where you have, you would never discuss whether the enforcement should be refused. It was crystal clear. Yeah. So uh, the Supreme Court in, in that sense is extremely, I mean, uh, in, in, in terms of the right to be heard, there is a, a major critique and I'm part of it that says that the Supreme Court is even a bit too arbitration friendly. Yeah. 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 So uh, that, is, that is sort of the general background. So that adds to the question whether Austria is a good place for arbitration. It depends, as always, what you want to achieve. But if you look for a solid award um, where there is no mingling of the courts, Austria is definitely a fine place. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, so time is going so fast, so oh, quickly. Yeah. If I would ask you just to give only two or three advices or tips to the young generation who would like to become and be good arbitrators, what the advices or tips should be from your side? Yes, the first one is a little joke again. Paul Getty uh, was a very rich uh, oil billionaire and is interviewed by journalists by the Financial Times. At the end of the interview, this very polite Englishman says to Paul Getty, Sir, our readers would be terribly interested to understand the secret of your success, but I fully understand if you don't wish to share it. And Paul Getty says, well, my friend, you're a nice chap and I have no secrets. I'm happy to tell you what I do. I get up earlier than everybody else. I work harder. You have to work harder than everybody else and you've got to find oil. And, you know, so uh, my conviction in life outside arbitration career is you have to work hard. It may lead to results you did not expect. Yeah. But I've never seen success without continuous hard work and dedication. Yeah. Now, our international arbitration is glittering. It's very interesting and it's understanding because it's a contrast to the parochial world of lawyers, you know, in their national prisons. There, you are free like a bird. You're international. So that to me is one of the fascinations, yeah, and, and the big cases. Um, be reasonable. So I think it is typically unreasonable for somebody to specialize too early, yeah. But again, um, just keep at it, yeah. And uh, and the other advice is that uh, I think as I said before, um, look for failures you make. Only they will teach you. The only thing I've also asked the, the, the members of my team in the law firm was be creative, don't repeat mistakes. <laughs> yeah. Make them once and then make new ones. <laughs> yeah. And you learn. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for this time with you. Thank you very much for teaching and coaching us cooking, but not only. Thank you very much. It was a real pleasure. And uh, see you in the next event. You're very welcome also for a Russian Arbitration Association's event. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure and an honor to be invited in the first place and to do this. Thank you very much. All the best to all the people who watch this, uh, either now or later. Yeah, thanks a lot. Cheers. Stay out of trouble, as they say. Yeah. <laughs>